So welcome. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. As I mentioned to you last week, we were going to have a wonderful guest, and he is here with us. Bye. Uh, <laughs> Ken Jones, as much as of a joker as Dr. Beeler, um, you're going to love him as much as I do. But first and foremost, how are all of you? Great. We're here. <laughs> Who went to Dublin? Who went to Paris? Who went somewhere else? Where'd you go? Yeah. And who hung around here and enjoyed the greatness of Oxford? All right. And who's tired? <laughs> who went to Vienna? Ah! And who came from Thetford? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was in Vienna, as you know, and here are my dear, dear friends. Aniko, she's Hungarian. When I tell you grad school buddy like no other, one day she just said, Dr. No, she said, I wasn't Dr. Green yet. Sharon, I will, I shall cry for you. I shall cry for you. I was like, it's not that serious, but thank you. But she's very super supportive. And I've known Leslie since we were undergrads at UM. And she's both of them, their love language is food. I'm attracted, I think, to people who who give me food, so. <laughs> um, honey, can you, can you open that door? Sure, Thank I, I, if there was a breeze coming in. The breeze is good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, she liked to cook for me and she liked to cook for me and I just love people who cook for me, including this fella right here. So we were in a vineyard and here is Leslie with her Austrian husband and wonderful kids and, Beeler photo bombed us, so just wonderful. Uh, how's it going with the, t the last 10% of, you guys feel good? Everybody knows what you're doing? Gabriel's like, yeah. All right, good, so let's just get that done. In fact, um, you're fortunate that Beeler is the, the math genius in our house, and he's already like given me uh, a template because truly, I, I would just get frustrated and just go A, 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 mybama.com, A, 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 I just don't care. But um, we kind of have to do percentages, so he already mapped it out for you. So you now know that the essay you did on Thursday, instead of 20% of your grade, and thank you for all doing it, um, it is 26.6% of your grade, but because you get like seven points on top of the grade you saw right now, so it's really bumped up, right? So if you have like a, a B minus, it's, it's gonna be higher. If it's a, you know, A, it's a little higher. It's pretty cool. A plus, like, ooh. Like, isn't that good, you guys? Yes. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? All right, now, here's our friend, Ken Jones. He lived in Neesden, would, would you say 80s? Actually, 70s, 80s, uh, from 90s? The, from the late 60s Ooh. through to about 89, no, until, until about the mid-1990s. Mid-1990s. And we're going to talk about your childhood there. He actually read 26A and had some interesting thoughts about how Diana Evans approached that book mm. that I would love for you to to hear. I mean, we've been talking about empire and cross flows and getting just a big story. Um, but then hearing the specific voices of people telling stories. And so I think we're going to benefit from that. His brother Gray couldn't join us, but uh, I think it's going to be a good chat. You're welcome to join in at any time. Here is Ken when, is that you? Ooh. Oh, I'd have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when John Wheeler and the jumper, mm -hmm. and they're going to they're going to tell you how they how they actually met. Uh, I'll give you a teaser. Here's Gray and Ken back in the day when Wheeler was a grad student over here, and his hair wasn't yet all white. That's that, that probably when I was talking to him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and here is Pete who couldn't join us. He's the youngest. Um, of the three boys, there are four of them, and Sue is in Paris. I didn't get to see her, but I sp spent time with her daughter, Emma. That's Flo, their mother, yep. a proper English woman who paid attention to how I prepared my tea the first time I met her. <laughs> and here is the wonderful Bert, the patriarch, who saved Beeler. Well, yeah. They used to hang out in this pub. We'll soon talk about this pub. 
And uh, just another picture of John with the family. Here's Hatish, who I got to meet before he passed away. Um, he's uh, a Pakistani friend of Pete's who was part of the Jones family, not unlike me. And that will, as we delve into this conversation, further help you see the complexities of empire. Again, Neesden is right here. Wembley is, he told me yesterday, he could, you could literally hear Madonna singing from his house. Mm -hmm. That's how close from Wembley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so in the book, when, you know, they're talking about Michael Jackson is at Wembley and Kimmy is with Michael Jackson, but we know our uh, best, Bessie and uh, Georgia are with those, those two dudes instead listening to Roy Ayers, music you just heard when you walked in. Um, you know, Wembley is that close. Uh, Neeson is just to the northwest, um, not as far northwest as Harrow, as I told you. And if you ever have a chance to go there, you kind of know you're near Neeson when you see Wembley right there. John's going to talk to you about this lovely little... Section. The roundabout. Yeah. yeah, and here's Gladstone uh, Park that Diana Evans does draw our attention to. And here is just a row of houses I just wanted to put on your radar. If, t if, if the house is 26, and we know 26A is the attic, but girls would have lived at the top. And so Neeson is like filled with houses that look like that. We're gonna talk about what happened to those houses yeah. and how Thatcher figures in. And that will get us back to neoliberalism. And I think because you've done most of the discursive part, except for that 10%, um, look at our time together today as just sort of an ongoing moment to continue sharing, right? And you might hear something that, you, that will push your thinking for that final one-page paper. If nothing else, just know that you met a new friend. So if you come back over to this side of the pond, you're a part of the Jones family, too. You'll feel that way after you talk to him. Um, before we really dig in, um, I just want to put some sounds um, just put before us. Uh, I asked Ken, what did he listen to when he was growing up? And um, he said, what happened to my average white man? Uh, we, uh, we played the average white man beforehand, and the way I turned things off is simply to to, yeah. to, to delete the uh, tab. Yeah, and no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, well, uh, average white man, yeah, pick yeah. up the pieces. So you guys earlier saw um, this group. I think it was our first week together. I just want to put on your radar, again, cross flows of culture. What does it look like with an Englishman born? Ken, are we the same age? Roughly. Yeah, so we both grew up listening to the average white band. Let's just roll it further. Roy Ayers was sampled by Dr. Dre, Mary J. Blige, so many people. We're not going to play that clip. He says he's not as big of a fan as some people of hip-hop, and that's fine. As I get older, I don't always understand what they're saying. I told him, but I do enjoy the beats. Uh, he also grew up listening to Led Zeppelin. <laughs> together I actually end it with stairway to he uh, heaven remember the laughter just want you to hear it and you can hear the blues influence 
And you know, Beeler invited us to think about theft, reappropriation, still lovely music. I've heard this song before. this out there why why would they have recorded a song with lyrics like that when they did any thoughts no. it's a pretty somber song yeah it's 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 it, I think, as i recall it's off the second album um and the the first album was very very bluesy yeah very heavy very bluesy the second album mm -hmm. they stretched and this was a part of them stretching mm-hmm Feeler? Uh, we'll come back to you. Yeah, I guess part of them stretching was taking in influences other than the blues. Which mm. their, their music, the first album, is, is not only rooted in the blues, but basically they, they took other people's songs and redid, retooled a couple of lyrics and, and called it their own, uh, a la Lonnie Donegan. Uh, but this begins to draw, when you get to Stairway to Heaven, and I think it's actually a very good album, um, you begin to see influences coming in from like Tolkien and Lord of the Rings and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're, they're definitely pushing the envelope of what they, what, they are doing and it's a sign of the times really okay um thank you for that last thing i want to offer is earth wind and fire no emily's familiar did you go to the earth wind and fire concert in tuscaloosa yeah. you dig their music Man, you, you dig their music you like their music yes i really it's not the originals but um yeah there were three surviving members the original band so it's pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah verdine was there a bit yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, one thing I'm noticing with Brother Ken is you, he's a trombonist, you guys. He's digging music with lots of instruments. know that with so with um yeah this is definitely the do you believe in love era so you guys know that with earth wind and fire very quickly this is the wedding reception music who has never heard of this group we're all on the same page okay so we're just giving you just a little biography of who ken jones is musically anything else you want to add that you listened to growing up uh, good, uh reggae um, reggae listen to reggae um, UB40, 
The interesting thing was when I was growing up, um, earth, wind and fire was, wasn't known over here. Mm. Um, I think the first album I ever heard was That's the Way of the World. Yeah. Um, and I was listening to a radio, <laughs> radio show and I'm, 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 I'm a geek for electronics and I was recording and stuff. And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll make a mixtape. So and it was a, it was a, 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 a show with lo lots of soul, um, you know, and, and Earth, Wind and Fire came on. I thought, who the hell is this? I mean, I'd never heard of them before. Um, and as soon as I heard them, that was it. I was straight into them. No problem at all. <laughs> goes for things like reggae, um, with, with reggae. Uh, Bless you. When I was, when I was young, only, only, only black kids listened to reggae. You know, white kids didn't listen to reggae. You know, just, no, no, man, white kids don't do it. I did. I loved it. It was great. You know, did you like Bob Marley? I like Bob Marley, yeah. Um, but I always thought Bob Marley was like the commercial side of reggae. Um, I like the heavier. Like whom? Oh, God. Burning Spear? Yeah, Burning Spears would be good, as would. Um, and around this time, when I'm, you know, around, around the 70s, you start to get lots of British bands starting up as well. I don't know what period this is. <laughs> Because I remember Pete, um, a few, maybe eight or nine years ago when we came over here, he actually gave me some reggae things that he burned. Yeah. Yeah. So your younger brother was into it too. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, he, he was the one who was, who, 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 uh, was going around with um, Hitesh um, and some other Asian guys. Um, and they used to go clubbing and listen to reggae bands live. That's really cool. I think that's a good way to segue into them getting some better understanding of where Neeston is set. Okay. And uh, we'll come back to Michael Jackson. So I'll let you guys take it away. Okay. Um, okay, as I, as I said earlier on, I, you know, I, was, I was born in Kilburn um, to a family that was not particularly rich in actual fact we were poor um, and the whole family lived in one house in a, in a road called Granville Road it's gone it, the, the whole lot's knocked down you know it, they, they would have called them slums um, but I lived there for about from when I was born through to about when I was two and we moved to another place which was just around the corner the reason we could do this was because we didn't own any property Owning property was just for the rich in those days. You know, you just didn't own property. So we lived in what they called council housing. Um, basically, council's the local authority for the area. And they allowed people to live in homes which they maintained and kept up to a minimum standard. And I mean minimum standard. They didn't spend money where they didn't have to. Uh, so we moved to um, a flat, to all intents and purposes, by which time we were then four kids, uh, me, two brothers and a sister, and we were there for about three, four years. And then we moved again, and we ended up in Neasden. Strange move. You know, you know one, of, one of the things from the book is, is how do they end up in Neasden? 
You know, you've got a Nigerian, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a woman from Nigeria, you've got a woman, you've got a, you've got a guy from Yorkshire. Um, what are they doing in Neasden? Why does that trouble you or make you curious? Why do you think... Why does it make me curious? There doesn't seem to be any sort of link. Um, my link to Neasden was the fact that we moved into council housing. They, they, they got a mortgage. Now, in the 80s, that was rare. Very rare. I would have, I would have called them rich because they could, afford, they could actually afford um, a mortgage. But they moved into, the, they moved into a place in Neasden. I still haven't been able to pinpoint exactly where it is. There's loads of places where it might be. But, yeah, the, the housing you saw is fairly typical of the area. Um, the fact that they've act, they're, they're actually living in the roof area as well is most unusual. Uh, certainly for that time, certainly for the ages. Um, but we moved up there. The first thing that we loved was there was a garden. You've got a garden. Mm-hmm. We can actually play in a garden. Absolutely gorgeous. And across the road, Gladstone Park. And it was just around the corner um, with a swimming pool. Open air swimming pool. It was, you know, it was like heaven to us. You know, we'd go and, uh, during school holidays, we'd go to the swimming pool. Um, we'd stay there all day. Absolutely all day. You know. By the way, if you've got any questions as we go, please chime in. Yeah. Um, so that was my introduction to Neesden. And I, as I say, I was there for about 40 years or, or so. Strange area when, 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 I first moved, when we first moved there because it was predominantly Jewish. Um, and what seemed to happen, and it still happens now uh, when you're in London, is you end up with a group of people moving from the centre of the centre of the city out. And at the time we moved to Neesden, it was predominantly Jewish. So I'm about 10 years old, thereabouts. <clears throat> Within the space of about ooh, five, six, seven years, that had all changed. The, Jew, the, the predominantly Jewish area, they, they, they moved on. What we then got was, was people like um, Irish families moving up from Kilburn. And once again, you know, this is, all, this is all happening because a lot of the properties were council owned. People weren't owning their own properties. So it started to change. Um, in the shopping centre, you had in the regular shops, there was a cinema that disappeared fairly quickly. Um, there's a place um, in the book which, which is called Alfred's. Well, I believe that's Charlie's, which is a, a wine bar actually in Neasden. Um, so, a lot of what's in the book is actually there in Neasden. Glaston Park's there, the house is there, the pond's there. Um, bits that weren't, bits that aren't mentioned, and why should they be? Um, tennis courts, uh, putting green. Um, it was a, there was there was a war memorial at one stage um, to the to Holocaust victims near the, near the entrance to the park. What happened while we were there? Um, went to school. When I when I ended up going to a secondary school. Um, it was predominantly black, black guys. It was the only school in the area which was segregated. Boys' school, girls' school. It's Watley in the, in the book. Um, I went to John Kelly Boys High School. It is exactly the same school. It's now co-educational, uh, and that happened, would you believe, as late as 2008. I looked it up. Up until then, boys and girls, completely separate. As far as I'm aware, it was the only school in Brent um, that was that way organised. Um, everything everywhere, everywhere else was, was co-educational. I have a question. Can you back up a bit? You said Yorkshire to Neeston was strange and we... Some of them are English majors, and I wanted you 
to go out on, on a limb with us okay. and think about the story from the, Diana's point of view. Yeah. So she is biracial from Needston. We're often told to write what we know about. So we know why she's in Need, Needston. She yeah. picks Needston. That's the neighborhood she grew up in. We thought about her character development and her, you guys, if you read the book, you know the father, excuse me, yeah, the father and his mother, there were some interesting things going on with his family, and last night we decided maybe he wanted just to get away from his mom, Mm -hmm. who knows, maybe he just wanted to get far away, he's a banker, so he's working in London, but where do you think he should have been if he's a banker, (sighs) with a Nigerian wife at that time? In the 80s? It's, it's an unusual situation. Actually, it's quite unique um, in my experience. In the 80s, you, you used to get mixed families, families of mixed races. But that is an extreme. In the book, it's an extreme. From Yorkshire and Nigeria, that is an extreme. Um, and even in Neesden, um, in, in its latter days, that would, that would still have been an extreme. Um, hmm. What they were doing in Neesden... I have absolutely no idea <laughs> um, because it doesn't seem to me it doesn't make much, very much sense. Um, you know, they they, they 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 meet, they get married, and then suddenly out of nowhere they move to Neesden. Okay, uh, there's somebody who suddenly out of nowhere knew, moved to Neesden myself, and in fact, one of your graphics up there I saw Aboyne Road, which mm-hmm. is where I live. Um, is it the one of these, or is no, it the one it was, that I called up? It, well, yeah, it was one of the ones you called up. And if you if you back out a little bit size wise, I can show you. Aboyne Road is right here, and I lived right there, backing onto this park with a with a reservoir, the Welsh Harp, just beyond it. Um, as Ken said, it's a place which is always changing. And when I moved to Neesden in 19, when I arrived in Neesden in 1989, as Ken said, there there were a great many Irish men and women mm-hmm. and children, yeah. is if you will, the overspill from Kilburn, but there was also a large West Indian population. There was also a large South Asian population. There were some Africans. They, I remember greengrocers selling, we were talking about this last night, yeah. selling oak, oak okay. uh, which means that they were catering probably largely to an, uh, to an African clientele. Uh, and there were a residual number of English men and women, including Ken's dad, who yeah. would sit in the pub that I hung out with, uh, with his back up at the wall, looking at the Irishmen and the South Asians and the West Indians who were playing dominoes. Uh, and sort of with this look of like, what's happened to my neighborhood, you know, as he puffed on his pipe, you could still smoke indoors at the time. Tell them how you met Bert. We were walking out, of, we, we can go back to the old spotted dog, the, uh, the pub you had up there. Mm-hmm. Um, we were walking out of the dog one night on a, on, on a foggy uh, night, uh, and uh, Bert, we struck a conversation in the car park in front. And this is Bert says, uh, I take it from your accent that you're an American. And I said, well, yeah, I am. And he had a sister who lived on the West Coast who had been uh, consorting with a con man. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And because of this, Bert says, well, Americans, I can't say I care for them too much. <laughs> And we walked on, okay, well, when, how do you respond to something like that? Uh, so we walked on towards the roundabout, uh, and you had a picture of the roundabout up there, and it's maybe, what, can 100 yards, 100 meters, something like that, maybe a little bit more. A little bit further. And by yeah. the time we got to the roundabout, we were actually in conversation, and Bert said, well, you live, you live on the other side of the North Circular Road, how do you get across this? Uh, and there's a pedestrian overpass, but you have to go way out of your way to get to it. And so I said, well, I just cross it right here. You know, I wait until there's no traffic, and I cross it right here. And Bert said, no, that's far too dangerous. You need to come down a little bit so you can see the traffic well before it gets to you. And by the time we got to the other side of the roundabout, he was going, well, how do you get home from here? And I said, well, I go through the tunnel under the North Circuit Road. Oh, no, that's too dangerous. 
you is he can't possibly do that. I must see you through there to make sure you're okay. And I go, well, Bert, well, then how are you going to get back? <laughs> yeah, oh, I know another route. And so we became fast friends. And I, and you saw a picture of Hitesh. Hitesh was a friend of high, high school friends of Pete. He was adopted by Bert's family, came around there for Sunday lunch. There's another kid named Matt White who yeah. was in the Army with Sue, uh, Ken's younger sister. He got adopted by the family. I got adopted by the family. And so I got adopted by the family. And so by the time it came to I Christmas, got adopted. <laughs> by the time it came to Christmas, we're coming up to Christmas. I said, but Bert said, what are you going to do for Christmas, John? I said, well, well, the pub's open. I'll hang out at the pub. You can't spend Christmas by yourself, John. Come and have Christmas. Come and have Christmas dinner. Come and have Christmas dinner with us. Uh, and so that was it, and that was 1989, and I've been part of that family. Bert sadly passed away in the late 90s, mm -hmm. um, and, but I've been part of the family ever since, and I'm tearing up right now. And it's okay, and I've been part of the family since I met, met you, because almost shortly after we married, I was here, and we were in Portsmouth, you guys, like way on the coast. Don't cry, babe. And we, we went to, to Thetford. And just so you know, you guys, Thetford, you've, you know, I did a gloss, but Thomas Paine, uh, we believe he's the first person who ever said the United States of America, not unlike John Locke, gives us, at least those spoiled colonists, some idea that it's okay to, to be ruled, but you must be ruled in a fair and just manner. So the, Thomas Paine was born where you live now. Yep. This is Thomas. You guys saw his face very quickly on Wednesday. And just so you know, I want to talk, I want you guys to address, John, if you can, briefly what neoliberalism is. And then the two of you sort through what Thatcher does to Needston in the house in which you live. Okay. okay so, but very quickly, you guys, um, Needston to Thetford, which Beeler and I visited about four weeks ago now. Uh, so here we are. It's quite a distance. Talking north. It's about 92 north, miles. North uh, east. How did you guys end up there? But quickly, John, what's going on in the 1980s politically? Okay. Um, on both sides of the pond. On both sides of the pond, you all, read, all know that Ronald Reagan is elected in, in the election of 1980. Uh, Margaret Thatcher is, becomes leader of the Conservative Party, the Tory Party in Great Britain in the mid-70s in 1979. She becomes Prime Minister because the Tories win, win a general election. Um, both of them are committed to what becomes known as neoliberalism. And to understand this, we need to go back to the 19th century and to what is called classical liberalism, which is not <laughs> the liberalism. When we hear the word liberalism today, we think, oh, big government, tax and spend, social safety net, uh, and things like that. 19th century liberalism isn't about that at all. It's about individualism. It's about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's about if you're poor, it's your own fault. It's not the fault of the system. It's not a structural problem. It's because you're lazy or you're improvident or you know, any one of a number of personal failings. And if that kind of rhetoric sounds familiar to you, you go, well, that comes from the Conservative Party, this comes from the Republican Party today, you would be absolutely right. Ronald Reagan and Ron, uh, Margaret Thatcher start that. Right. That they adopt the tenets of classical liberalism, stand up for yourself, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, the government shouldn't be in the business So remove the it. social safety net that FDR put in place on our side of the pond, right? Yep. Actually, deregulate big business. Yep. Rising tide, excuse me. Rising see, tide flips, flips, lifts, all, lifts boats. all boats. So if you give money to businesses, they will hire people and the people will be fine. And we know that doesn't always happen that way. So how does the council house issue and factor come into play? Okay, basically, um, what we had was a council house in Neesden. Um We were there for a long time there for a long time. Um, I can remember 
sitting in the dark because we had power strikes. No electricity. It would disappear out of nowhere. You know, um, we basically just sat around, went to bed early, you know, just... But the, the funny part was, was that when we got... The way, we, the way that my family managed to get out of Neasden was um, the local council, Bread Council, um, were getting rid of the council housing. So and this is one of Thatcher's initiatives. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 so so they so they basically paid people to leave. And I think, as I recall, um, they were offering somewhere in the region of about twenty thousand pounds, which wasn't enough for a full mortgage, but you could get, you could you could get a partial mortgage for that. Why Thetford? Because my sister was living there. Um, She'd moved up with her then husband um, because his family lived there. So there's my sister living up in, 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 in Thetford. My dad um, was diagnosed with cancer and he had about, he was told he had about five years to live. As it was, it was three. But he thought the best thing to do was to be, get my mum where my sister was, they'd be together and all that sort of thing. Um, and so the family moved um, almost ad hoc, straight up to, to, to Thetford. Um, a weird move. Um, at the time, most of the family moved. I was living in the East End of London. Um, but I got so fed up with London. Once the Oscar Wilde said, you know, a person, you know, you know there's no way you should, you shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be bored with London. Um, I was bored with London. I find Can you tell them what you did for a living for 30-some years? Okay, right. 30-something um, <laughs> 30, 30 years. I worked for London Underground. Um, started as a guard. Yeah. Then I was a train driver. Then I became a trainer. So the subway that you guys have been on, he might have been your driver how many years ago? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, about 25 25 years ago. Right. Um, and then I became a trainer, and then I got involved with computer-based training. So I had a fairly wide experience with, with the underground. Um, I loved every minute of it, to be honest. It was great. But I do find London very, very impersonal. In the book, one of the sisters moves to Tottenham, which is North London. And she says, it's not the same as Neasden. That's the problem with London. It's very segregated. If you go to South London, it's a completely different world to North London. And that's the Thames. You know, that's, the, that's the border between the two. Um, and you don't even have to go very far south of the river for it, for it, to, for it to completely change. For a long, long while, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the slum areas were south of the river. It was the East End, but then the East End got, got refurbished, you know, revamped. Um, a lot of it became a um, business area. Um, and, but, but in the south, it took a long, long time for the quality of life to improve. In northwest London, you could go from Neasden, just down the road, to somewhere like Willesden or Harlesden, and there would be like two different worlds. Willesden and Harlesden was predominantly black. Kilburn was predominantly Irish. Neasden was a real mix. If you're familiar with the, with the British novelist Zadie Smith, Zadie Smith is from Willesden. Uh, which is only two tube stops away from the east, end, but Ken's right. It, it's a, a completely different community. There were also a lot of Australians in the area around Willesden, where they insisted on calling it Willesden. Willesden. Yeah, which is how it's spelled. I, I still didn't quite allow them to hear about, did we talk about how your parents got the house in Neasden? Yeah, well, we, we, were, we, were living in Kil we were living in Kilburn. No, but how does, how does it happen that poor people can get a house in Needston? There was some government assistance right. when right. you left, too. 
basically what, what happened was um, we, we, we were a family of six. My sister was born in the flats, uh, flats in Kilburn. Mm -hmm. So we were then a family of six, um, two parents, four children. The place was too small. Mm -hmm. So the closest place that they could move us to, which was still um, council property, was Neesden. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got it. And then what happens to the house in which you were living with Thatcher and part of the narrative? Um, it's now uh, private. Um, it's, it's now owned by people. Um, she gave council, people an opportunity to... To move out. And the whole idea was so that, so that the councils could then sell the properties on. Bingo. Yeah. Do you guys hear what's to happening? Privatize, Displace people. To privatize public housing, in other words, which was one of Thatcher's big initiatives early in her, early in, uh, her prime ministership. She had yeah. So I have a question. Kind of, may have yep. missed it. Um, you said that they were offering like that, like, not really, it wouldn't have been a really good like, mortgage or whatever, but like, just that money to like make them move. Yep. Where do they expect them to go? Like, just out of the area, like, disappear? Yeah, yep. yep. Like, yeah. See, see from, from the council's point of view, that didn't, they weren't concerned about that. They no. just wanted you to leave. Yeah. No, no, but Savannah, I, mean, I think about what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Like, like Tuscaloosa, when I, we first, when I first moved there 11, 12 years ago, we would see people come in for football games. We're sort of in the, on the east side. We, we'd see the cars come in, but that was about it on football yeah. day. Now it's just nonstop cars, nonstop cars. Why? Because since the tornado, people have been <clears throat> displaced. Since the rise of all the fancy student housing, people have been displaced. So they're living in Jasper and further north, blah, 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 and it's just nonstop cars. Mm -hmm. Like, where do they go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, in, the interesting thing is it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of going full circle because what's now happening is, is that you've now got people who are so on the breadline, especially with the situation we've got at the moment, where they can't afford a mortgage. Yeah. You know, if they've got a mortgage, they lose it mm -hmm. because they can't afford to pay the, you know, they can't right. afford to pay yeah. the mortgage. The, the escalation um, of housing prices is very similar to what's happening at been yeah, happening. It's, and it's, and it's been getting worse over the years. But now, you, but now we've got um, high interest rates. Um, it doesn't make any difference what you're earning, um, unless you're really, really earning a lot. Uh, in which case, who's worried about high interest rates? And you're not going to move to these, but you're not going to move to these in any way. Yeah, so, uh, so, so basically, it's a case of, we'll give you the money, get out. Don't care where you go, just get out. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so we got the money. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, so, like, after they pay all these people to move out, what yep. was kind of the what were the demographics of the neighborhood? Okay, that if you if you go there now, um, you will probably find that it's uh, the, the, uh, it's it's moved on a pace since I was there. Um, yeah, I think you've still got a a, a certain amount of, um, of, of of Irish there, um, but. I mean, John was up there fairly recently, and, and apparently it's a lot, a lot of... A lot of um, uh, I, I went up there a few years ago just to see the old neighborhood, and as a consequence of membership in the EU, there had been a huge influx of Eastern Europeans, Poles and Hungarians and Romanians, and it seemed to me like every other storefront had signs on in Polish. And, but... Britain has left the EU now, and a lot of those people have gone back to the countries from which they came. And Charity and I, Dr. Green and I, went up there a few weeks ago, and most of the Pol Polish storefront signs are gone, and in their place are a lot of places with Arabic script. And it's not possible to tell exactly who they are, because Arabic is used in North Africa, it's used in Egypt, it's used across the Middle East, it's used in Iran, even though it's a completely different language, it's an Arabic script, and you can actually go further east. And so there is a large, very large Muslim presence in the East. Now, is that, was that your impression, Dr. Green? What was it again? The, the, there's a very large Muslim presence. Oh my goodness, in, in, in yes. Muslim um, in fact, um, they know about the Luton Airport incident. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I have, to, I have to reply. There's just so much going on as we prepare to go back to the States. Um, 
So you heard about how, how I had to go back to, from Luton yeah. to, to Richmond and, and I see the graffiti and I, but I know Needson because I see Wembley and John had already taken me there. But I told John that the needs and I saw it, I didn't like because it was so patriarchal. All of the coffee shops were filled with, with men and kids. Now there's a part of me that knows that the women are probably in kitchens somewhere, glad that the men are in the coffee shops. But that whole public private sphere thing just sort of like, I didn't really like it. So yeah, we still saw Oprah. So there's definitely a West Indian Nigerian presence. Mm -hmm. Okay, but can, um, if I may, can we go back to the book? Tell them your impressions of Mr. Hyde. Who knows who Mr. Hyde is in the book? Who's Mr. Hyde? Just quickly, someone. Isn't it like her dad when he drinks? Her dad when he drinks. Bessie and George's dad when he drinks. Yeah. And tell us what you think of Mr. Hyde. This is off topic, but not entirely. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Mr. Hyde disappears and goes up into town. Um, he drinks at a place called Alfred's. Um, in actual fact, in real life, it was probably a place called Charlie's, which was um, run by, I think, I think what was he, was he Portuguese? Yeah, Portuguese or Greek? Yeah, yeah. probably Greek actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it's like a Greek restaurant, but it had a had a bar attached. So, he, so that's probably where he, where he's drinking. Um, in the eighties, you never heard about people like Mister Hyde. Mm. I mean, even in the even in these days, unless it's unless it's something really bad happens, you don't hear about it. Um, I don't know whether it's because people still feel that they are. They, they need to keep it quiet, you know, especially the people that are being abused. Mm -hmm. um, but in those days, in the 80s, um, it was most unusual to find out that that sort of thing was happening. Very unusual. Um, but he, he, he's in Easton, he's wandering around the Easton um, to the extent that he actually walks past his own home on one occasion. He just walks past. And he, he doesn't even realise he, he's, he's done that. Yeah, mm. um, but apparently, you know, Aubrey is absolutely marvellous, provided he doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. When he does drink, Mr Hyde comes out. Mm. Mm. Is it, is his behaviour, I'm going to make sure I phrase this carefully, like, again, keeping in mind the narrative of the story, mm -hmm. is it part of some kind of anger longing that he has for Yorkshire? Remember, if you guys read the book, the, ki the, the kids and the mom start cleaning because they know Mr. Hyde is coming back. And, you know, when he wants his pudding, you know, Princess Diana is getting married, but he wants his pudding now. Like, the very thing that he seems to want to hold at a distance he also seems to demand of his family, and not only his family, but his browner family. Yeah. So you want to hold mom at a distance, but you want to come home and make these women girls behave. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, patriarchal situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, the male ru rules the roost. Mm -hmm. um, whether that should be the case or not, I don't believe so. I, I don't believe that should be the case. Uh, in, the, in those days, in the 80s, um, the, the, the man of the family was the breadwinner. You know, so he could demand that his dinner's on the table at a certain time. Um, he can demand that um, he can go out and have a drink and enjoy himself. The interesting thing from the book's point of view is you never hear about um, the wife going out and going out and enjoying herself. Eventually, she does go to church and that sort of thing. But when, you, when you're reading about the Mr. Hyde parts of it, she doesn't seem to go out and about. Hmm. She's, she's housebound to all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And so are the kids to a greater extent. Um, and you've got the situation where they are in such fear, and that's the only way you can put it, really, um, that when they go out and they expect to Mr. Hyde back, they tidy the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's weird. I mean, I don't know where, I mean, I find it weird. I don't know whether you do. 
But well, I find that really strange. So real quickly, one thing you should know is they had to quickly skim 26A yep. alongside of a, okay. a quirky book written by Warren Ellis, this musician who played with mm -hmm. Nick Covey on, he's interested in Nina Simone's gum, a piece of the gum. I'm going to buy that book. You'd love it. Um, so they were supposed to read two chapters, but then they had to skim it. Okay. To, so you may know, and some of you may know more than the rest, because some of you read the entire book. Mm -hmm. But just know that the father is a bit out there, but so is the mom. It's, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, Aubrey is. Hmm, how can I? How can I put it? She even remembers the name. I totally forgot the guy's name already. Um, <laughs> no, he's. It, the phrase I'd use is "mummy's boy." Yeah. Um, when he was in Yorkshire, he was dominated by his mother. Now, it is possible, of course, is that the, the reaction that he's he's going through while he's he has his own family is a reaction caused by responding to that. Mm -hmm. I'm now in charge. <clears throat> and he's never been in charge before, apart from when, when he's working. So there is a pot, there, the possibility is, and the likelihood is, is that he's, domi he's domineering because he can be domineering now. Yeah. Where, whereas before, he couldn't because his mother would just slap him down. And it's, it's problematic because if we bring in the larger you know, narratives that we bring, that we're addressing in this class, he goes into basically a colonized space. Uh, this black woman who's running for her life because yeah. she doesn't want to be forced to marry in the tradition of her tribe, this older man. So she saves him, he saves her, he takes her to the metropole and then he dominates her. And you guys should know he's pretty much a, weak, a weakling, yeah. but he gets his strength from creating this family that he, he can boss, yeah. but the way his mom bossed him. I mean, I mean that's, the way, that's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Before we part, I wanted to bring in Michael Jackson. You said you could hear Madonna singing every lyric. Um, oh. Just so you guys know, when, when my family moved from uh, center, center of Miami, basically, Coconut Grove, to the suburbs, and they built what is now called Hard Rock Stadium, where the Tide has played national championships, um, but we used to call it Joe Robbie Stadium when the Dolphins played there. Um, we could hear the lyrics of anyone performing in that stadium, so I could really relate to this. I just want to get you some sense of the Michael Jackson that um, Kimmy would have seen and ask Ken if he remembers Michael at Wembley. Um, let's get these commercials out of the way. And if anyone has any questions, um, Feel free, and, and again, I know that you guys are tired, and we're probably going to end class early, uh, but here we go. Um, let's see, get a little music in here. We were listening to the instruments earlier. Where were you this night when he was performing at Wembley? Were you at home, or were you already in, in Thetford? Um. Probably, probably already in Thetford. Um, I, don't, I don't remember Michael Jackson at all. Well, I remember my Michael Jackson, but not indeed. <laughs> it was, you, if it was 1988, it was the year before I showed up, so you were still in Wembley. You must have been out maybe doing a pub crawl or something like that that night. I couldn't possibly be doing that. No, no absolutely not. not. No, absolutely not. No, no. Um, never. Uh, and, and <laughs> by the way, you guys, you should know this is a beer connoisseur. Before he arrived, he has a map of all the pubs in Oxford. That he to be and in yeah. his and in his he has a notebook and he has yuck, uh, cloudy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. when we've gone to beer festivals, you know, he'll have the beer and yada yada yada. And when Beeler was still drinking beer, it was just and they're not like drunkards. It's just they're literally tasting. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Her heard me injudiciously say that I like the old spotted dog. Um, uh, and, and, and oh, that, that was funny. Beer, yeah. And I, I thought the beer was pretty good. I was ready to carry the IBA by that point. And it hurts thinking to himself, oh, this poor, deluded American. Yeah. You know, he doesn't know what a good pub is or a real pub is. And real beer is, so we got to take him on a pub crawl. So Bert and Ken and Ken's brother Bray 
took me down to, we started at Royal Oak, I remember Royal that. Oak, the, the, bridge, the bridge at Royal Oak. Yeah, yeah. And, and went through Paddington, the area around Paddington, uh, it finished by, at a pub where we were drinking Bass Number no. Ten, which is very powerful, potent stuff. Yeah. It's, a, it's a barley wine. Barley wine. Is, uh, and I, I was so drunk by the time that I got home that we got up the next morning and burnt the ritual was Saturday morning. We went down to to, to Portobello Road, and Burton flew, wheeled around, picked me up. We had when I had you know strolled around. I had a breakfast at the cafe, and then I went off to work in the archives, and I started feeling the hangover about one in the afternoon. It's just like I need to go home. Right Probably like the kid we saw this morning yeah, outside right, the right. dining hall. Did you guys miss that? Yeah, it, 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 not of our program, but he came oh boy. out of the dining hall Whatever and, he, and proceeded to get very sick in a... In a if you had right. walked in, he probably would have put it on your shoes. He literally, it was right by the door. He was just like... It was just like. Maybe he had a. Maybe he had a this is probably more information than you need to know. I see something. But it's another one you just want to hug him and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, not in this case, I don't think. But he, he could have had a stomach bug or something like that. But, you know, the, the cynic in me is going, yeah, I probably had too much to drink last night. Yeah, yeah. You know. Okay, so we're going um, to wrap it up. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask. How did your family feel about getting offered that twenty thousand pounds? I know that you said you were great by, question. By the time yeah. that the money was offered, in actual fact, um, I'll, I'll answer the question and then and then tell you something else about that. Um, by the time that the money was offered, um, it was a case of we can't wait to get out of here. Mm. You know, we're just going to grab the money and run, literally. Mm. Yeah. By which time. The family basically decided they were going to move up to Norfolk, Thetford in Norfolk. But the weird part about it was um, the council offered this money for, for over a period of a, about two years. And when my dad applied for it, they withdrawn it. They'd actually withdrawn the offer. So what they were going to do with, with the house, I have no idea. It was still a council house. So he basically went up to the council offices and said, look, you know, do you still want us to get out? Mm -hmm. And they, they extended it for, for my family. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, by, by which time, yeah, definitely <coughs> out of London. Um, and my dad didn't know where he wanted to go. He was talking about Southwest, but it was too expensive. So yeah. Devon, Cornwall, that sort of thing. Um, Kent was too expensive by that time. Um, Norfolk was reasonably cheap. But um, so it, it, with, with, Sue, with my sister up there as well, um, Sue, um, it seemed to be a logical move. Yeah. So it was more just logical rather than, oh, this feels like opportunity. Oh, no. I mean, like I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the thing about it was, was they, they wanted to get out. So, so the family wanted to get out. Yeah. Um, and it was easier to go to somewhere where we already had a, a family member. Than to go anywhere else. Yeah. I, I can remember your dad and mom going up to visit Sue. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean they went to, and, they went to and, Sam Place. And, and, yeah, and staying in, you know, either a bed and breakfast or an Airbnb uh, kind of place. And Burke was really enthusing to me about the, the countryside, being out in the country. and. Uh, once they moved in, at ten furbish or close, he started feeding the wood pigeons, who got, which got immensely fat, you know, um, and, and things like that. He he really took to that part of England. Uh, that was my impression. The, fun, the funny thing is, that's absolutely right. But the, but the amazingly, um, he he missed certain parts of London. As John, as John said, um, virtually every Saturday morning he'd go down to Port, Port, Portobello Road Market. He used to live around the corner from it when he was a kid. When he was a kid, um, he was born in 1936. Yeah, and um, he grew up in Paddington. And he grew up if, in you grew, if you come into Paddington well, Station, as you all have, that used to be a slum area of London. The, 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 the borough was the borough of Kensington and Chelsea. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was a slum. Um, they, the, his family lived in a, a road called Swinbrook Road. Yeah, I don't believe it exists anymore. Once again, knocked down, wiped away, rebuilt. Gentrified. 
Yeah. Um, and, and if I remember Bert telling me correctly, he grew up in a house which did not have an indoor toilet. There was an outhouse in the backyard. Oh, good grief, no, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah um, even when um, my family was living in Granville Road, um, outdoor toilet and one of my uncles kept chickens mm -hmm. yeah. to supplement the food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eggs, meat, um, because all that stuff was not easy to come by. Yes, Haley. Yes. So, growing up in England during the time you did, what are the biggest pop culture events you remember, like as a kid slash? Great question. Yeah. Sorry, pop culture. Mm -hmm. Um, big pop culture events. You you yeah. said you heard Madonna and Wembley. Oh yeah. Uh, right. Um, yeah. Um, the, the 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 main places to go were uh, Wembley Wembley Stadium. Um, they also had Wembley Arena. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other place was. The Hammersmith Odeon was always a good place. Mm -hmm. I went to see Hawkwind there. Mm -hmm. um, and big, of, We saw a big journey in the same space. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, it's and, now called something else. And that even the, time or they, had, they had a dancer who managed to set herself alight on stage. Yeah, yeah. Really, they had really, a really clever. Dancer named Stacey. Stacey, who, yeah. Who, who was very Can, candles all around, all, all around the band. You know, sort of, what did, they, they played space rock. You know. Wow, yeah. 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 Pies kite, kite most of the time. Um, yeah, um, yeah and, uh, and basically, um, she's, dry, she's, she's dancing around in this diaphanous thing. She was not about uh, taking her clothes off. Oh, you know, no. I mean, don't want to be work, yeah. yeah. But body yeah. paint, you, you yeah. know, and all, and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it was, uh, and she set herself alight. Um, those, those I, as I recall, were the, were the main venues. Um, mm -hmm. So living. In Neesden was quite handy for Wembley, mm -hmm. but was a real pain for Hammersmith. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about it was because everything's, you, know, you talk about the inter interconnectivity of things now, the, the, connect, the connection in London would, would have been the underground. Mm -hmm. You jump on the train, you can go anywhere, literally anywhere. Um, during, during my stay in London, you couldn't go, would you believe, to, I'll never get this right. Areas in North London, if you have a look at a tube map, they sort of come in and you've got sort of the circle line and then you've now got the, the sort of an out, outside circle line and then other lines come out. But mm -hmm. there are huge areas in between with no, with no underground, mm -hmm. no, tube, no tube, tube line at all. Mm -hmm. South London's terrible. Yep. It's improved a lot because they've actually extended stuff like National Rail southbound and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the Docklands Light Railway now is great for the East End. Mm -hmm. um, the East End used to be, forget it. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the East End, well, firstly, you didn't go to the East End. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, if you did want to go to the East End, you'd probably go down to somewhere like Whitechapel and bus it, mm -hmm. jump on a bus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, um, pub, pub culture, Great time for pub bands. Great time for pub bands. Um, you could go and listen to virtually any sort of music. Um, Brixton was another good place. Um, predominantly reggae in Brixton. Um, predominantly rock at, at the Hammersmith Odeon. Um, Wembley Stadium, well, whatever just happened to be on. Um, and same for Wembley Arena. I saw, Paul, I saw Paul McCartney in Wembley Arena when I was uh, living in the East. And, and I saw the Moody Blues then, mm -hmm. so that gives you some sort of idea. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're, we're gonna to go ahead and say goodbye for now. Um, who feels good about the last assignment? Most of you? Okay. Um, let's... Um, Adjourn, and but we're going to thank Ken Jones and Dr. Beaver. And if I have it right, um, so you didn't get a magpie, right? No. Your number was the closest. So let's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have some weird thing that I'd like to share. I bought uh, 17 stamps yesterday. I want you all to write um, a note to yourselves and mail it to your house. Can you do that for me? And um, I want to do a PS, but I want to go ahead and do the PS so I don't see the note.
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to write, P.S. Dr. Green thinks the world of you on the back of all of these. And by the way, these are cards I've collected from Vienna everywhere. Um, and I'm going to give you the stamp, and I'm going to ask you to mail the postcard. And I'm still your crazy, quirky professor, but it's from the bottom of my heart. I just want y'all to press on. Okay? Um, I can pretty much tell you, well, you guys are, you mean the world to me. Um, I can be pretty, you know, upfront and say, like, there's no, no one has less than a, a, a B in this class. You did so well. Except for me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you did so well, and I'm, I'm so we proud of you. Of the room right now. Yeah. And some of you are, you know, beyond an A+. Plus. So don't make me cry. This one right here, you come in here, young man. It <laughs> just disappears. Um, I just told them that uh, tomorrow I'm going to give you these postcards I've collected since I've been in Europe. And I bought 17 stamps. And um, you're going to send a postcard to yourself. Back in the States, you're going to mail it tomorrow. But I'm going to put the PS on the back. Ken, this is the one who. His, his essay was just like, whoa, this is a guy who's been in my class for the last three and a half weeks. It's like, what? I'm talking to me? <laughs> just, I, I'm so proud of you. Frenchie, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> he makes me fight to read every word. So mm -hmm. What the, and you know he's saying something that needs to be heard. Like, why is he making it so hard? And, <laughs> and on the paper, it's just like, pristine. All of you, thank you. I'm not crying today. You are the coolest, the best, and don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. And if they do, send them to me. Okay? And I want you all to take care of each other as we try to get back to the other side of the pond. And if you're hanging around this side with your family, take care of yourselves. We're living in historically crazy times. All right? Amen. Count of three, roll tide. One, two, three, roll, roll tide. tide. Yes. Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, can we take a picture? Oh, I wanted to how it finished picture, but we were missing a few people. Everyone here, sign in. There's a couple of you who always forget that I saw your beautiful faces. Aren't they great? I told you.